We want to do business with people we know, like, and trust. We've all heard that a thousand times, right? So how do you do that? You, you focus on adding value. Hello, welcome to episode 200 of the Smart Agents Podcast. As always, my name is Michael Walter, and I'll be your host. To celebrate this milestone episode, we are joined by the founder and CEO of Authorify, parent company to smart agents, Calvin Curry. Launching his own real estate career in 2006, Calvin quickly learned the power of authority branding and direct response marketing. Starting with long-form sales letters, Calvin and his team developed home selling tips books promoting real estate agents as market experts. Throughout our conversation, Calvin shares how both smart agents and Authorify have evolved over the years, the power of authority branding, and how his role has changed as Authorify has grown. But before we get on to the day's featured interview, the Smart Agents Magazine is available and full of insights and strategies designed to help real estate agents grow their businesses. Inside, you'll find interviews and advice from leading real estate professionals, marketing tips to flood your business with leads, and even swipe and deploy files full of practical tools to enhance your business. Be sure to click the link in the episode description to claim a free digital issue. Also, if you enjoy this conversation, be sure to like and subscribe. The Smart Agents Podcast streams on all major podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and of course, YouTube. And finally, if you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. We're always on the lookout for new stories to share. All right, let's get on to the day's featured interview with Calvin Curry. As a special gift, he's offering a free digital sample of the Home Seller Tips book. Get your own copy at authorify.com forward slash sample. All right, so the way I'd like to start everything out is if you could just introduce yourself to us a little bit, who you are and a little bit about your uh, marketing, real estate. You have a pretty wide uh, background. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Calvin Curry. I actually started... Authorify back in 2009. At the time, it wasn't called Authorify. It was something else. We were selling training for real estate agents. But how I got into that is I actually became a real estate agent in 2006. So I got out of landscaping. A lot of my family was in real estate and it was the easiest path of the next career in my life. And so when I got into real estate, you know, I really liked the direct response marketing. I loved the marketing component. This is before Facebook and YouTube and social media as we know it. And at the time to get business, one of the best ways was either cold calling, door knocking or mailing letters. And I liked mailing letters. I liked the long form sales letters and, you know, would explain who I was and what I could do for them and try to position myself differently than the other agents that were uh, going after them. And over time, you know, I started working with my dad and his team. And then I worked with one of my brothers and his team. And I always levitated towards the back end of the business and the marketing and lead generation, which is a huge part of real estate. So that's how I got started and then started, you know, a handful of different real estate training and marketing companies. Um, and eventually started this one in 2009 and it's morphed into what it is today. Um, you know, we started with a lot of long form sales letters and different things there. Craigslist, when that was the thing, uh, we're really good at uh, Craigslist marketing and Facebook marketing and uh, training agents on how to do it. And over time, you know, I think the real estate letter that we had was like 30 something pages. <laughs> it was a little crazy. Uh, and it was, you know, I printed out of my printer at the real estate office I worked at. I worked at a Keller Williams. I worked at a Remax office. Um it was, it was funny stuff. We were struggling to get people to read our real estate letter. So over time that morphed into a book because a book has more authority and that's what worked the best, especially when it came to high-end luxury clients. So that's a little quick backstory of who I am and, and how I uh, got here. Yeah. Once you guys put the, uh, you know, put the book together and really went that way with it. How did you see um, your your conversion rates change? And then also when you started showing this to other agents within, uh, you know, the different circles you're in, what was that reaction like? Yeah. So the, the real estate letter was actually very effective for a long time. And it really made a difference on the demographic kind of made a difference of who would read it. Um, where I was at the market I was at, which was North Central Florida, it got a really good response rate. And then when I started having agents tested in other markets, you know, across the country, some of them would do really well with it and others wouldn't. 
But when we put a cover on it and enhanced the pages up to a book level and added more content and less salesy stuff and more changed the positioning, that really helped across the markets. And so when we put a, a cover on it and changed the positioning from less of a sales letter to more of a book that educates and informs and adds value, that's when the actual... Uh, that changed the the whole perception of it. And sometimes people wouldn't even read the letter, you know, whether it was uh, our team using it or else real estate agents using it across the country. And they say, hey, I received your book. You're the only agent that sent me a book. I want to talk to you. And so it was just a change in positioning. Like think of people who write books. It's really hard. You know, we pay for books. We don't pay for sales letters. Think of also how you sort your mail. I mean, every time I get mail nowadays, you know, back in the day, maybe mail was perceived differently, but I always grab my mail, walk to the trash can and sort it over the trash can. What goes in, what goes out, what gets open before it. Like if, if I'm opening a letter, I'm opening it over the trash can in most cases. And the minute I see junk mail, it I don't read another word. It just drops. <laughs> and I believe most people do that. Well, when you get a book, how do you how do you perceive that? That's something I go to Amazon and buy. So the perception of value for me with a book is like 20 bucks on average. Sometimes I'll spend more. Sometimes it's a little bit more affordable. But I, even books that people have mailed me for free, you know, marketing to us as a company um, or even as an individual, I'll always hang on to it. I'll put it on my desk and I'll flip through it because if someone sends me a book, I almost view it as a gift. You know, I've been mailed books. I've been mailed a lot of books for business. People will be like, hey, I saw you at XYZ or I know of you and your company. And they'll mail me a book book trying to solicit our business. And I, I have a lot of high respect for people when they mail me a book. I'm like, they took the time to mail me a book. I'm really curious of who these people are. I remember one guy who mailed me a book. It was a marketing book, you know, and it was soliciting our business. I kept that book on my desk, I think, for over a year. I meant to read it for at least two. <laughs> and I, mean, I have books all over my house. I have bookshelves at the office. When I had an office, I had books everywhere. Um, so it was kind of an interesting thing how long it took me to move that book to a bookshelf. I did skim through it. I thought about the guy several times um, and his business it just changed the way that I thought about him. And I think that's really how our books have helped real estate agents and even helped our team when we switched it from a sales letter to a book. It's just the perception that consumers have when they receive it is very different. And I even think about how many books have I been sent as a consumer? I haven't been sent many um, that I can think of. I'm trying to think of one. Like I wish I've received one like for dental work, for example, because I have so many questions about dental stuff. <laughs> that's like as you age and you you think about your teeth, like that's a question I have often. Um, so I just that's that's kind of the whole thing behind the book. Yeah, for uh, you know with Authorify specifically, and you know um, starting Authorify. And, you know, before that, it was uh, Smart Agents and, it's, yeah. you know, since kind of re uh, the Thorify product itself has gone on, you know, to b much bigger things. And so that's where the uh, the new uh, branding came along. But, um, what, you know, why why did you want to take this out to a wider, uh, you know, marketplace rather than, you know, just the people that you were working with? Yeah, good question. So me, I didn't think about branding much throughout my career. You know, branding has become a lot bigger thing with social media, for example. We now are familiar with the word influencer, where that really wasn't even a thing 20 years ago. Um, you know, Authorify or this company has been around since 2009, 15 years or so. So when I started, I would just sell a training course or this or that, or a tool to help real estate agents. You know, for the last 15 years, I've mainly focused and our company is mainly focused on real estate agents and we're just starting to get into some other industries. So me, I never really thought about it. I would see people, you know, doing YouTube, for example, that kind of was where the first influencers almost took place. And then they started getting into Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and some of these other areas. So I never really thought about it much as a brand. More I was thinking of it, I have a product, I want to make it available to other people and help them with their business using this product. And so I didn't think of it very well 
like most people, and it's, it's morphed over time. We've now a personal brand and influencer marketing is very commonplace. People know what that is. Where 20 years ago, if you talked about personal brand or even when real estate agents would put their face on their, on their sign, that was kind of uncommon 20 plus years ago, 30 years ago. Um, I wasn't selling real estate 30 years ago. I was just getting into my career, you know, 20 plus. Um, but anyways, the, the point is like, as it's morphed, I didn't really think of it just like everyone else. And I didn't really concern myself. But now that we see how powerful a personal brand is, smart agents, when we started that, my goal was to be offering smart, you know, advice like smart agents providing smart uh, uh what would that be? The smart agents providing help to the industry versus it being guru centered. You know, I've seen so many gurus over the ages that have a lot to say and they run out of things to say. So they start varying outside of their lane. You're like, why are you talking about health? You were this. <laughs> it's not like they don't know anything about that. That's just our assumption as we follow and watch them. So with smart agents, it's all about finding really smart agents all across the country and sharing their advice and creating a community uh, versus just being a personal brand for one or two people. Um, I think a personal brand is really important when it comes to real estate agents and small businesses. You know, think of a painter or a roofer or a dental contractor. You're normally hiring an individual that has a small team um, or even a remodel contractor. Some of these companies can be big. But when I started Smart Agents, that was the goal. And the book, we had the book. We'd be selling the book for a few years up to that point. We really hadn't decided on what name to put that under. So originally... It was just another product offering of smart agents. So we had website after website. Back in the day, we had a website called Listing Funnels, and there was tons of other <laughs> websites. And we would just have a whole, if you log into our GoDaddy account, for example, you'd see hundreds of domains. It's almost like the domain boneyard <laughs> for our company. And so being intentional is pretty difficult, you know, and, and spreading your efforts out across all these different media properties is really hard. And it's really not the best way to do it. Um, what I'm saying is we started with smart agents. We then landed on a Thorify for a name for our company for really for the books and for positioning yourself as an authority uh, where years ago, you know, we were like most people, we didn't think it through very well, but now we're a lot more focused on that. And, you know, when I look at like a company versus an individual, let's say like a real estate agent versus a dental office, because that's kind of an interesting dental office is still based on a doctor or a, a couple of doctors, doctors working together, which is pretty common in a real estate agent's example. They should focus on building up their personal brand because it's normally one individual. We want to do business with people we know, like and trust. We've all heard that a thousand times. Right. So how do you do that? You, you focus on adding value and not just sitting there asking for business constantly and selling. Selling's great and it is absolutely necessary to close sales. But if all you do is sell, 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 people feel like all you're doing is taking and you're not providing any value back. And if you want to be positioned as an expert and as an authority, you have to provide value back. So that's kind of, I know I got off track, but that's how we start. We went to smart agents and then to Authorify. Um, and now we got, you know, a few different brands that we're running on. So it's, we're not focused on a personal brand for our company as much as we are focused on helping people do that for themselves. Right. And with Authorify specifically, you know, the tagline is elevating your business with authority. What does that concept mean uh, to you and the company? And what should it mean to real estate agents out there? Yeah. So, you know, there was so many words we could have chosen for this tagline, but elevating means really just to lift you up, bring you up and keep you top of mind in front of your clients. Um, so elevating your brand with authority. If you think about marketing and personal branding, uh, you could call it expert status, authority status, but everyone's, you know, authorifies all about positioning as an authority, right? When you're positioned as an authority in your local market, in your niche, in your area of expertise, people want to come to you. Like, think of it this way. If somebody has, you know, needs to sell their home tomorrow and they know you know everything about selling homes, who are they going to call? Um, if they know that one, you know, let's just say their dad sells real estate and their dad's part time and he's in middle of retirement and they know he's really good, but they have an emergency. And their dad's traveling 
but they know this other real estate agent is the bomb when it comes to real estate and they know everything about it. Chances are they'd probably call that other person to help them out or even think about dental work. If you have a horrible toothache through the middle of the night um, and you have an emergency, you're going to go to the ER, or you're going to call your dentist of 20 years or the dentist that's offering the best advice. Or maybe you're one of those people that avoids um, going to the dental dentist. Right. So you don't have a dentist, but you've been following some guy or some girl on Instagram and they have been putting out all this great advice about dental care and all this stuff. And so you're doing it so you don't have to go to them. <laughs> and then boom, you get a toothache. Who are you calling? You're calling that person. That's kind of how I think of it is that you're elevating these people, these businesses, these real estate agents and positioning them as an authority. So when somebody's ready or needs you, they're, they're thinking of you. They're thinking of you first. Right. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's, you know, for, um, you know, real estate agents, you know, to really focus on building your uh, authority and not just your, you know, your reach or your image within the uh, the community, but, you know, uh, show that you have that expertise and you yeah. are uh, providing value. hundred percent. That's what it's all about. Yeah. What, um, so, you know, when it comes to uh, authority building, um, you know, agents, especially now with, uh, the Instagrams and the TikToks, and it's, it's been really evolving over the last few years, but agents, um, are hearing more and more that they need to put themselves out there. They need to be visible, uh, and they need to build a, uh, personal brand. Uh, but sometimes, you know, they might feel a little bit uncomfortable showing, uh, you know, kind of peeling back the layers of that onion maybe and showing some more of their personal life. But, um, you know, why should they really kind of do that? And how does, you know, this type of authority branding help, you know, get over some of those um, uneasiness? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think of it this way. There's a lot of people doing social media, personal branding, influencer marketing well. Most of us are following some of them, right? And for me, I would be perfectly thrilled if no one ever knew who I was. I would rather not put myself on social media. I would rather not have people know who I am. I'd rather be somebody that is just known to my family and friends. That's just who I am. However, that's just not the reality that we live in anymore, especially when it comes to business and someone like in a business where someone's supposed to be viewed as an expert to get hired, like a doctor, let's just say, for example, if a doctor works at a big hospital like Mayo Clinic, I don't necessarily need to know who they are in order to go get surgery by them. They're working for, a, a, you know, they're getting their business through Mayo. That's how their career is, is fueled. But if they're a specialist, let's just say a plastic surgeon um, or something like that, then their brand and people knowing who they are because they're paying out of pocket, they're not going through the regular, a different route to get them. They should be building a personal brand. So when it comes back to like a real estate agent or a dentist, um, small business is a little bit harder, but when it comes to a real estate agent, for example, what I would say is first off, there's no hard rules. People are winning many different ways. People are winning with faceless videos. People are winning with voiceovers where they never show their face. Um, now I don't think that makes sense for real estate agents, but I, first off, I would say, if you're like me, first find people that resonate with you, that you like, that you respect and see how they do it. I think with real estate agents, you know, think of that thing. People want to do business with people they know, like, and trust. One way to get to know somebody is to kind of share some of your personal life. But when I see people share too much personal of their life, I personally cringe. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to know about this. Why in the world are you putting this on the Insta on the gram? Like, I literally almost am uncomfortable seeing stuff that I see sometimes. And, but some people are comfortable with that. I personally am not. <laughs> I don't want to put some of this stuff. So I think the other thing is to look at other real estate agents. There is so many real estate agents out there. You could follow them in other cities and other areas in your area. I don't believe in copying, right? Because I believe in getting inspired, but like all of us are unique and we can all do it differently. But this is the other thing. If you only put content and information out there and they don't know who you are, um, and they don't have any like personal connection with you, then maybe they feel like they don't know you as well, right? Or they mm -hmm. feel like maybe you're not transparent enough. I think that is a fine line and it's also up to how each of us feel comfortable doing it because I know I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable doing it personally. And I, str I now I'm not a real estate agent, I'm a business owner, so I don't really have a big personal brand. I've thought about it, but I'm personally, 
I'm not overly excited about it. If I was a real estate agent, though, I would absolutely be all over it. Um, and my Instagram would look completely different than it does today. So what I would say um, obviously, I'm not walking in real estate agent's shoes because I'm not one, but I have been one in the past before social media was what it is today. I would first do what I feel comfortable with. And then second, I would definitely share knowledge out there. I think real estate agents should get in front of the camera because it's the next best thing to being in person face to face. You know, if somebody can hear you, that's one you know, they're, they're building some trust with you through that auto, you know, through your voice. If they can see you, they can see our facial expressions. They can see our eyes. You know, I never wear sunglasses or even blue blocker glasses on business meetings, even when I'm on Zoom. Why? Because I want people to see my eyes. I want them to be able to see me, see how I'm responding to them and feel a connection because that's kind of distance today in this virtual uh, world we're living in. So I know I'm kind of bouncing all over, but I think each each person has to pick uh, what they're comfortable with. And then also think of the layers of how people know somebody. I think about my personal circle, my family, my friends. So let's just say, you know, here is we don't know anyone and here is we really know them. Maybe this is our spouse, our girlfriend or somebody we're living with, right? So there's a huge gap in between here. Maybe here is our friends. Maybe here is some of our family. Maybe here is like, if you have kids, they really know you, they're living with you. You're not gonna come from here to here. You're never gonna get here. You may be never even get to the friend zone. You're definitely not family. <laughs> so even if they say, oh, you're like family, they're just flattering you, let's be real. Um, but you wanna get in between that friend and you know, kind of near the top. And if you're only talking business, you're never getting on that personal level. So if it was me and my comfort level, I would be sharing probably, you know, maybe 60 to 80% business. And I'd probably be putting 20% of my personal life in there. And I'd probably be putting like stuff like traveling. Uh, I don't have kids. Uh, I'm not married. I don't, you know, so I, I wouldn't have that to share. But if I had some kids, I think that's up to each personal person's preferences and their comfort level. But I think the more you can share that's not weird and awkward, <laughs> and we all know what weird and awkward is, I would think, um, I think that would make sense. I see a lot of real estate agents sharing their kids, their vacations, um, they're sharing their, their life, their struggles. So I think it's really up to an individual comfort level. And I see some people that don't put anything personal there. And that's probably just what they're comfortable with. And they keep their personal life very, very separate. And I respect that. So I just, I don't think there's any rules, but I do think it's important to figure out, hey, what am I willing to do? What is the cadence that I can perform at and commit to something and stick to it? You know, hey, uh, I really don't want to be on camera. Okay, well, know that that's going to come with a cost. You're not going to get as good of results, in my opinion. Um, that's an opinion. Could you overcome that with a bunch of other work? Yeah, absolutely. But is it worth it? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I really think there's, there's no great answer, but I think in this day and age, I would definitely be on Instagram. If, unless, unless you're targeting an older demographic, if you're targeting people in retirement homes, for example, maybe you want to be hundred percent male. Um, maybe they're not on social media. Maybe they're only on Facebook, but it, it really depends on who you are, who you're targeting, what's your audience and you know, how can you reach them? I want to be, if I was an agent, I want to be where everyone's paying attention. I, I, we all know that when we go into the airport, not at the airport, I'm thinking I was just in traveling into the bathroom. I was going to the handful of bathrooms in the airport recently. There is people on social media in every bathroom in America, in my opinion. They're, they're holding their phone at the urinal. It's stupid, but I want to be on their phone when they're sitting on the toilet. <laughs> I want to be in front of them there. So you know what? They ain't reading mail. They're not normally opening emails unless they're very business oriented, but everyone is on social media, when they sit on the couch, even when they're watching TV. If it gets boring, what do they pull out? You know, next time you're at the stoplight, maybe you are the person who's doing this. Look around you. How many people are on their phone? Maybe in Florida, um, I don't think there's a text. I, I don't know, but I look, around, I look around at that stoplight and I would bet 90% of the people while they're at that light are on the phone. How many of us have been behind a car and they don't go? We're having a honk because that person's on the phone looking at Instagram. It happens to me, not to me, but I, I've honked at many people like, I see them on their phone. They don't even see the green light. They're looking at, at something. <laughs> so that's why I think personal branding, like be where people are already looking. They're looking on social media. That's where I'd want to be. 
Right. And I think it brings up a good, you know, you've touched on it a a few different times in a few different ways, but the difference between, um, you know, that, uh, you know, being the, you know, the authentic, the authenticity versus the authority and you can, you know, have this great, you know, personally built out, you know, Instagram page or social media profile. But if all the stuff that is on there is you kind of, you know, being like the stand up comedian of real estate, if I'm new to your area or if I'm looking in your area, I don't know if necessarily if that's the person that I'm going to yeah. choose to work with because I, I, I want somebody that I can trust has some business acumen. Yes. And so, but at the same time, if all I see is your latest listing and no, you know, personality behind you, I can't make a connection with you. So I think there is a good, you know, you do have to have that good balance between the two. I agree. I've pulled up so many, like I follow a lot of real estate agents cause I'm curious what they're doing. And there's some agents that they look like they know what they're doing, but I don't see any videos of them. So I don't know who they are. I see a ton of listing photos um, which just is like, I can see listing photos on Zillow guys. I don't need you to post that. Like this was a really good point that I heard recently. They say when you go, and I haven't really gone and verified this, but they said that on Red Bull's social media accounts, there's never cans of Red Bull being advertised. It's all pushing the lifestyle and what it's all about, which I think is interesting. So when you think about real estate, what is the product? It's homes. I'm not saying you shouldn't show the homes. People want to see the homes. Some of the best videos when it comes to real estate, and even when I see real estate agents doing YouTube, for example, are the home tours, especially on these luxury listings. Um, so I I'm not saying don't show the product. The product is important. But if all you got is listing photos and all you got is information and there's nothing on there about your face and there's no videos, I don't build a connection. This is kind of an interesting side story. The other day I was hiring somebody that was going to uh, be a social media person for us and they were already creating social media content. And she had a bunch of videos out there and really did a good job demonstrating uh, her skills through this. And so I was hiring her for a social media role uh, as an influencer type of person. And when I got on an interview with her, I was on Zoom. Um, I felt like I already knew her. I felt like I didn't even really need an interview. Now, obviously, I still should have interviewed her just like anyone else. But like I already had all this. Like, I already felt like I knew this person, but she didn't. And I almost acted like that. And then it almost seemed like it was like, a shock to her because, you know, she never met me. She didn't know who I was, but I felt like I knew who she was. That's how I think you want to be positioned as a real estate agent. And, and I know all of us, especially as we age, we're conscious of how we look or how we sound. I, I mean, I hate how I sound on audio. I, when I listen to myself, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I posted that. And I know everyone probably feels that way because nobody wants to look at ourselves and, and, but I think it's just like, get over it. I'm perfectly comfortable with who I am. I'm, you know, feel good about myself, but I still don't love looking at myself and photos of myself. But I think that's just something that all of us just have to get over. And the more we do it, the less that becomes an issue, right? We're all humans. <laughs> None yeah. of us are perfect. So who cares? Just do it. Right. I want to uh, touch on, you know, um, specifically the smart agents, uh, you know, brand, and that has, uh, changed over the years and, and really what, you know, from the very beginning with offering the books and that it really kind of became, you know, more, uh, content driven and, and what we've been doing with this podcast and bringing on agents and marketing experts from around the world, uh, to share their, uh, expertise. Uh, but, you know, recently, um, we did launch a monthly magazine. And so tell me a little bit about uh, that along with the membership package and why, you know, why that was so important to you to go back to smart agents and really do that. Yeah, that's a good question. When I got into real estate, I did follow a lot of gurus and a lot of the people out there creating training that are still in the business today. They have amazing concepts. Like for example, I, I started cold calling and I followed Mike Ferry, loved his stuff. Um, he has a no BS approach to business that really spoke to me. Um, and he really helped me in my business, even though I wasn't able to afford his coaching. Uh, I consumed his, his books and his, his stuff. And I, I loved his stuff over time as I've gotten deeper into business and I followed people. Um, I've also realized that a lot of times these influencers and gurus aren't necessarily walking a mile in our own, in our shoes. And it's not like they need to, you know, like, 
when, as I've started even this business, I stopped being a real estate agent because the split focus just doesn't work. And I wish I would, there's been so many times where I've been like, man, I'd like to just get my license and go sell real estate and use our product and just show these people how good this product is. Cause I believe in this product. I wish I had had a book when I was a new agent, you know, some of this is scratched my own itch. But one of the other things that I realized is as I've gone to events and I've been, I've been to a ton of training events for a bunch of different topics over the last 20 years, talking to people in the audience that are out there doing it, you learn so much from. And while I love and respect the people, you know, like a Mike Ferry, Tom Ferry, Brian Buffini, people I learned from, and Tom, I don't think was really as big as he is today back when I was in, in business. I don't even know if he had started his business, but his dad had, and I loved his dad's stuff. But anyways, they have a lot of great things to offer. I have nothing but respect for all these people out there creating content and training for agents and even in other industries. However, when I'm talking to agents in conferences, they have so much to share. And a lot of times these influencers are learning from them and resharing their stuff. And so really our goal was just to bypass the guru and go straight to the source. Now, again, not saying that these gurus don't have great stuff, but that's really what Smart Agents is about. It's about going and finding people who are out there doing the work every day, testing firsthand, learning stuff, and interviewing them and asking them questions. I mean, I see so many agents that I'll send to our team and say, we should be interviewing this agent. I love what they're doing. I saw one last night. There's this lady out in Utah creating these uh, home videos that are absolutely hilarious. I don't know if it's all just real estate agents watching them laughing, but her videos get a lot of a lot of views and they really catch me. Every time I see them, I'm impressed. And she obviously has a high production putting these things together, but I feel like you could even do this well on a lower production. I want to talk to her or I want you to, Michael. You know, that's that's one of these people. I'm like, I, I was about to send it to Anne, but it was really late. I was like, I need to go to bed. Um, but those are the type of people that I run into. And I'm like, I wish I could sit down and interview this person. If I was an agent, I'd want to pick their brain. But not of all, all of us have the time, the energy, or even when they, we reach out to them saying, hey, I want to talk to you. Are they going to just talk to some random real estate agent reaching out to them. A lot of them won't. Um, not, not like they don't want to share their knowledge. They just don't have the time for it, right? So that's kind of like how I view smart agents is I want to talk to or have you, Michael, talk to these agents, pick their brain, share their knowledge and make it accessible to everyone else. And I'm pretty sure we have a way for agents to recommend uh people that they want to, you know, I'm always thinking of people. I'm always seeing, I've sent several to Ann, which is our editorial director and said, we need to get this person on our podcast. They have a, they're doing X, Y, Z really cool. And we should see what they're doing. Now agents can be a little bit cutthroat and they don't want to share their knowledge. And I respect that, but when they will, I absolutely love it. I feel like this is a big world and really my view on business is a, uh, what do they call that? A growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. So I always feel like there's plenty of business to go around. So I'm always willing, you know, I don't, even competitors that we have, I feel like they make us stronger and better. And together we push each other up. Having somebody to compete with is actually very, very powerful. It's very good. It's good for business. It's good for each other. It's good for pushing our growth. Um, I feel it's, 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 I always love competing. Competing is awesome. So that's kind of how I view it. Um, and that's why smart agents, that's where we kind of, it morphed over time where when we started it, we put our books under it just because we didn't have a brand for a Thorify. Um, and it was kind of a placeholder, but my goal with smart agents was always to go out and find real estate agents and to interview them and to share their knowledge and to make it accessible to other agents um, when they're willing to share their, their info. Not everyone is, but yeah. when we can get the secrets, we'll get them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, just before we wrap up, I do want to talk to you about uh, creating a, creating a company culture and a vision is something you've done, you know, for years. Um, yeah. So, you know, as you, um, you know, uh, have built your companies, um, you know, how important is it to uh, be intentional with your leadership style and, and to really kind of build a company within that um, initial vision that you set out for yourself? Yeah, that's a huge question. And one that has taken many mistakes and years and years of learning. If I think about most real estate agents, most salespeople are type A driver people 
uh, we're a little bit more ADHD or tend to be. <laughs> we get big ideas and we don't always stick to them. And that's at the leadership level, right? At the top of the, the, the person on the team. I think a lot of real estate agents are that way as well. There can be magic bullet chasers. It's fun to chase a lot of rabbits. What's the same? When you chase all the rabbits, you catch none, something along those lines. So I think about that when I first think of leadership, right? And when you're a smaller company, because I started this company with just me, and now there's 100 plus people on the team today. Um, and when you're small, it's culture is less important or it seems less important because the culture is the people on the team and the culture really is you as a leader. There's a saying in business calling, uh, I think it was, uh, I think I read about it in Vern Harnish's book, Scaling Up, where the culture starts at the top and trickles through the entire organization. So if you ha are a crappy individual <laughs> is going to trackle all through the organization. Now, I know that's maybe a little bit strong. I would recommend everyone watch that documentary called Enron. That was kind of eye-opening. Now, this is on a massive scale on how a culture went negative and people ended up in jail over it. Um, and it just got toxic and bad. And it's culture, especially as you grow, I'd say if you're under 10 people, it's pretty easy that it's, it's you. You, the leader, are the culture. And you're always the culture. Even with 100 plus, 200, 300, it doesn't matter what size the company is. The culture is the people at the top, the leadership team. And really that starts with the person leading the company, whether that's the CEO um, it, or if you call yourself the president, it doesn't really matter. You are the culture and you have to watch yourself. And, and there's, uh, there's two books that are written really well that talk a lot about people and culture. There's, well, actually, there's actually a few. Traction's one, uh, Scaling Up's another, and then The Culture Code. The Culture Code's a really good book as well. Um, read them all, uh, some of them multiple times. And as you grow, I think you have to be a lot more intentional with it. With a virtual team, it takes a lot more effort to maintain a strong culture, to keeping people on the same page. They, you would think that as a business grows, it becomes easier to communicate, and, but it's a lot harder, uh, especially as you get multiple layers of management, or even if you have virtual employees. Uh, let's get thinking about it as a big company. Let's just think about it as a virtual company, which most of us are in today, um, or especially real estate. You're running all over the place. If you're a dental office, it's a everyone's there. It's a little easier to create that camaraderie and maybe do some company lunches or bring lunch in, et cetera. But when you're running around as a real estate agent or you have a team, if you don't have an office or you are virtual, uh, being intentional about it is really important. I'd say the top things that I would focus on for culture is one would be core values. What are the core values that you live by that people have to uphold to stay on your team. And if they break those core values, will you remove them? They're really not core values if you won't remove people from your team, if they break those core values. We have core values and we hold very strong to them um, because we must, otherwise they're useless and they have no value. So core values was a changing, a ch kind of a crucial changing, uh, almost like a milestone in our business. When we established them, some people didn't like them when we first put them in place, they kind of laughed at them and said, oh, this is woo woo and stupid. And it would have been easy to just say, yeah, you're right. We don't really need these. Um, ah, yeah. But I've also realized as you grow, if people don't agree with the core values, they shouldn't be there. They should find a better fit for themselves and their family. Um, if people fall out of alignment, that's okay. It's not like they're bad people. It just means they don't work for the company and for that team anymore. So core values is one. Um, I think in a virtual world, one of the things that we do at Authorify that has really helped us is we do a regular all hands on deck team meeting. It's only in normally about 30 to 45 minutes, but all the leaders give an update of their KPIs, which is key performance indicators, where they're at versus the goal and how their team is doing. And most team members, uh, most leaders only, it's only only like two to three minutes each, sometimes a little longer if they have more to say, but that helps a lot. So if you're in person, it's a lot easier to do this with maybe some company lunches, some meetings, maybe some all hands on deck. Um, but there's so many ways to do this, so many ways to get it done. I Years ago when I first started, I would have thought it was less important, not important at all. But as a team grows and as you need alignment to the goal, uh, it it's becomes really, really important. And it's something we're always working at. I don't think we're great. I think we're decent at it. Um, 
but there's always room for improvement. I'd say those books that I recommend, Attraction, Scaling Up, and, and The Culture Code, would be three amazing books. Scaling Up and, and Traction are very similar, just a little bit different on how they achieve that. Uh, I think of Scaling Up almost like the Bible of business. You can buy the book. There's a section on people. You can read through it, and you could just implement what makes sense for you there. So that's how I would probably go about it if I was doing it again. Right. And then my last question is... Um, you know, as the founder of this company, like you said, you started this as a team of one and now it's grown to over a hundred. Um, how has your uh, role as the founder changed over those years? Yeah. So when you first start, you are the every person, everything person. You have to learn everything. And it's easy, I think, in the beginning to think of I'm going to learn it invest instead of hiring for it. And in the beginning for me, you know, I, I was one of 10 kids. My dad wasn't giving me money to start it. My dad is an amazing individual. Uh, but you know, I wasn't privileged per se. And I had to, I didn't get funding. I didn't have funding. So I was bootstrapped and I'm still am today. We still are today. So I had to make money as I go, as I went. And a lot of times when you're first starting, you want to fix everything and do everything. And if you want software, you want to learn how to write software. But I think the best thing is to get, generate revenue and then hire really great people. One of the mistakes that I think I made early on was um, rooting too much for the underdog and sometimes hiring people that I thought would be me and would learn as they went. So like in the beginning, I was doing a lot and I made so many mistakes throughout the years in my role and what I would do. And, and that was really hard to figure out what do I do as I grow? Because I'm really confident in my own ability to get things done. And I struggled with letting things go and giving up control to other people. And I struggle more with that in the beginning than I have obviously today. I'm 15 years into this business and 20 years, 22 years into entrepreneurship. I started my first business at 16 um, years old. That was when I got started with the landscaping company. But like now today versus then, you know, with this many people, I really love doing work. I really do. Like meaning I'm the person who's making something or building something. And as an entrepreneur, I still really want to do that. And I kind of get antsy sometimes, but as a company grows, your role will greatly change and it's always evolving. Now I feel like now I have a president of the company, which is TJ. He's running the day to day and he's actually way better at it than I am. I wish I was as good, <laughs> good at it as he is. He's really good in so many ways that I could go into detail. So his role is the integrator. And if you read the book Traction, they talk about the integrator versus the visionary. And the visionary is the person who's creating the vision, deciding what to go after, how to implement it, um, the goals, et cetera. Um, so that's my role today versus before I was more of the integrator. Before when I worked with another partner, he was the visionary and I was the integrator. So this will make more sense if you read the book Traction, but over time, you go from the person who's doing the work. If your team gets big enough, you're then maybe half managing, half doing the work. I think about real estate teams. A lot of times I'll see teams where the uh, the person leading the team, the person who started it and owns it is the best salesperson and they're on everything and their pictures on everything. And a lot of times I'll see them run themselves into the ground. We've seen that so many times over and over and over again. Um, so I think that balance is hard. But I think the way for all of us to grow and at different stages of growth, there's different things required. That's hard as a leader, like seeing somebody like um, Steve Jobs, the Facebook founder, I'm forgetting what his name off hand, like seeing them still running their companies today. They have to have massive growth from being startup to still running it. That's insane. Uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon. It's insane to see people. How much they have to change and grow is insane. So I'll give you one thing. I am a learner and curious as hell when it comes to stuff. Year to date, I've read 27 books or finished. I have others that I'm reading and the majority are on business. I've had some on health and self-help and other stuff that I'm curious on, but just year to date, 27 books deep. Um, now, granted, I was traveling for a month in Lima at the first of the year and I got 16 of those knocked out. So I'm not that crazy, <laughs> but I do read a lot. I watch a lot of podcasts. I'm constantly trying to grow and change. One of our core values is always to be improving. So I think if you're going to successfully grow a company, you must grow 
at the pace of your company or it will bottleneck and get stuck with you. And it's happened to me many, many times. I've made that mistake many times. So it's, it's not an easy question to answer because at each stage of the business, something different is going to be required of you, the leader. Um, and it's just, it looks different at every level and in every scenario. So it's not something you can just answer with a do X, Y, Z, but it's definitely fun. Business is fun. I view it as a giant game where you're helping and providing value. You're contributing and changing people's lives that you're serving. Um, and when you win, you make money. When you lose, you lose a lot of money and it sucks. <laughs> so you get rewarded. Like money is a KPI of how you are doing in your career um, and how the business is doing. So. Right. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a great way to, uh, to wrap it up. And I think, you know, through the course of doing this podcast, one of the main, um, one of the, the overarching themes that I have seen, you know, from some of the most successful people that I have interviewed, uh, is that they are also always learning, always adapting to new things, uh, you know, trying to uh, figure out, you know, better ways to, uh, you know, get their name out there and make things yeah. more efficient. hundred percent. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate it. I want to thank Calvin for joining us today and sharing how both Smart Agents and Authorify came to be. Remember, go to authorify.com forward slash sample to get your own free sample of the digital home selling tips book. So once again, if you think you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. Well, that wraps things up for this episode, but remember, follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Again, I'm Michael Walter, and we'll see you on the next episode.